top officials of the university also were in the procession. And then suddenly in the main building, I found a young guy stepped in one of the staircase and said, I'm Martin Luther King Jr. Somebody said, I am Mahatma Gandhi. Somebody said, I am John F. Kennedy. I was really surprised that how come these three names were uttered by American students in South America, which is known as the conservative part of the United States, the state which nurtured slavery even after the adoption of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1893, which was written, approved, and supported by, as you know, Abraham Lincoln. So I joined the procession, and after a while, the procession was over, and everybody was coming back to their offices, and I met the president, the chancellor of the university, Professor Leo Rose. And I asked Professor Rose, what is this? He said, don't you know? Today is the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. So we celebrate 7th of January as a memorial day for us. You know, I was really curious because I found that Mahatma Gandhi was linked with Martin Luther King Jr. So instead of going home, I went to the library and started searching books on Martin Luther King Jr. And I found out not many, but some of the authentic texts. Besides the collected works of Martin Luther King Jr., the seven volumes, which at that point of time were edited by nobody, none other than Dr. Claiborne Carson. So I developed curiosity of Dr. Carson after having seen those volumes of Martin Luther King Jr.'s collected works. Then I checked in the Google search and I found out that he's a professor at Stanford University and he's the one who was authorized by the widow of Martin Luther King Jr., Coretta King, to edit the collected works of Martin Luther King Jr. And you know, somehow or the other, I got drawn to these texts and I determined to write a book on the ideas which Martin Luther King Jr. espoused and those which Gandhi espoused are identical. Now this led to a question in me that how come Gandhiji was born and raised in India? He spent some time in South Africa and he developed ideas in support of nonviolence. And Martin Luther King Jr., who was on the other side of the Atlantic, developed the same kind of interest. And he found out that nonviolence could be an effective weapon against ruthless, draconian state. So both Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. fought a suppressive state. In the United States, it is Martin Luther King Jr. And in India, it was Mahatma Gandhi who combated racism, oppression, and all kinds of injustices. So, as I said, I took a vow that I would write a book on the confluence of thought between Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi.
and I, I'm very happy that I finished the book and the book was published by Oxford University Press, New York in 2013. Now you may ask the question, why did I talk about all these things? Because this has a direct link with Dr. Carson. As I said, when I saw the collected works edited by Dr. Carson, I searched in the Google machine and then I found out his details and I sent him an email saying that I'm from India and I would like to work on this particular theme. Do you find it feasible? He was very excited. He talked about his visit to India in 1973 and you know he recollected all good memories. And he said, Bidut, this is the right topic, please go ahead. And at that point of time, there was a conference in Columbia, New York. I was invited to that conference. It was also about African-American history. And there I met another gentleman. He was a professor of history at Columbia. His name is Professor Marable Manning. Now, Marable Manning and Dr. Carson, they do not belong to the same school of thought, simply because Marable Manning dealt with another militant African-American who also held the views which Martin Luther King Jr. held. Yet their path was different. Now, Marable Manning was a great admirer of one of the, you know, most effective African-American radicals. His name is Malcolm X. Now, you, I, I'm sure you know about him. Now, Malcolm X, let me tell about tell me tell you about the you know, X part. Why it's X? In America, if you meet any of the African Americans, they are all most of them, well, I would say all, most of them happen to be the the you know the kids, the children of those who came to the US as slaves. And at that point of time, the slaves were given the surname of the slave owners. So, you know, if you see any name, for instance, even Carson, I don't know the history of Carson, but Carson, if his forefathers were one of the sl slave owners, his family must have got that surname from the slave owners. The Malcolm X opposed it. He said, I don't want to be identified with the slave owners. That's why he never used the surname of Doolittle. His surname was Malcolm Doolittle. But he said, because Doolittle associates him with the slave owner, he rejected Doolittle. Instead, he put X. So, Barrel Manning is an authority on Malcolm X. The Malcolm X was a Christian, then he became a Muslim. And at that point, when Cassius Clay, the famous boxer, who became Muhammad Ali, Max Malcolm X also became a Muslim along with Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. So, you know, this was a part of the story. So, Marable Manning was an expert of Malcolm X. The, probably the most authentic biography of Malcolm X is written by Marable Manning. So, you know, I'm quite fortunate to have met the two topmost African-American intellectuals who wrote about two important personalities of the 20th century. For Marable Manning, it is Malcolm X. For Dr. Carson, it is Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I met both of them, but during the course of my writing, you know, it's unfortunate that Marable Manning passed away. So I didn't have chance to show him the manuscript, but he was always encouraging. Since as an Indian, I undertook a work on the history of African-Americans in the United States. So Malcolm X is an interesting character, but somehow or the other, I couldn't, you know, focus on his activities simply because of paucity of time. After th three years, I came back to my parent university, that is Delhi University. 
But during those three years, I focused on Martin Luther King Jr. and wrote a book. While writing this particular book, I was in constant touch with Dr. Carson. And you, uh, I, I succeeded in persuading him to come to my university campus in Virginia. And he spoke. He, we spent two nights together. I learned a lot about African Americans, especially Martin Luther King Jr. So, you know, this is Malcolm X. This is Dr. Carson. Now, this time, when we are planning to hold this particular lecture, I requested him through email. And, you know, you'll be happy to know he was so excited, he immediately accepted our invitation. So now we have with us Dr. Carson, who is going to speak soon. But before that, I would like to remember the contribution of our colleague, the former colleague, Professor Asha Mukherjee. You know, when I joined, I floated this idea of holding university lecture series. And it was Professor Asha Mukherjee who took the responsibility of taking it forward. And with he, her contribution, with her effort, with her labor, we have been able to finish 19 university lectures so far. It started in early 2019 with the lecture by Dr. Dilip Chakraborty. And it was over, it was finished by a lecture just before the lockdown by Dr. D.P. Singh, the UGC chairman. So far, we had 19 lectures. And you know, these lectures were given by topmost global intellectuals. You know, we had Shugoto Bose from Harvard. We had the, the financial advisor, uh, Dr. Sajib Sanyal. We have uh, Geraldine Forbes from the United States. We had uh, Dr. Subha Basu from McGill University. And you know, there are many, you know, we have got, you know, uh, experts in foreign policy, Mr. Rajiv Bhatia. So, you know, there are many intellectuals who came and addressed us from this particular platform. And so far, it, is, it was the responsibility of Professor Asha Mukherjee. And I'd like to put on record from this platform as Vice Chancellor of Bishop Bharati, my appreciation, my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Asha Mukherjee. And I'll expect her to be an active associate of this particular lecture series in future. So friends, we are now about to listen to Dr. Carson. And this is about essentially a theme which is very interesting. And those who listened to my lecture the other day, they remember that a lot of African Americans came to India and met Mahatma Gandhi to understand the importance of nonviolence as an effective weapon to combat a racist state in the United States. And so far as my research goes, I found out that this journey between the United States and India started in the 1930s. And most of them who came to, met, came to meet in Gandhi, they're all African-Americans and they are generally priests, just like Martin Luther King Jr., who was also a pastor, you know, priest. So they came, they met Gandhi, they tried to understand nonviolence, and a lot of people went back and taught the art of being nonviolent to the African Americans. And as I said the other day, Martin Luther King Jr. was inspired by Gandhi's teachings after having listened to the president of Morehouse, Benjamin Mays. And he went out, he bought books on Gandhi, and he studied them, he read them, and then he found out that nonviolence or love, care, concern could be so effective in transforming human mind. So if you look at the, the journey, political journey of Martin Luther King Jr., you'll find that he 
utilized non-violence, love, care, comp compassion to inspire a large contingent of African Americans to participate in the campaign against racism. And it will be a mistake if we simply say it was the African Americans who participated. No, you'll find a lot of white Americans, a lot of white Americans also participated in this act of injustice. They fought racism because it was an injustice to humanity. And as a result, you know, American government, when Lyndon Johnson was the president, they accepted the right to voting for the African-Americans in as late as 1965, which was to me the direct result of the civil rights campaign, which was spearheaded by a lot of African-Americans before Gan uh, Martin Luther King Jr. appeared on the scene. So if we say that the credit of having adult suffrage in the United States is that of Martin Luther King Jr., I think that was historically inaccurate. I would like to say that the, the fight which started with the African-Americans in the 1930s led to the adoption of 1965 Voting Rights Act in the United States. So it's a long journey, it's a long battle that African-Americans along with their compatriots, I mean the white Americans, fought for adult suffrage, which culminated in the adoption of the voting rights of 1965. So, you know, the Gandhians became an important force to reckon with. The Gandhians who were inspired by Gandhi's idealism, which corresponded with Christian ethics, inspired a lot of African Americans and their white American compatriots, which ultimately led to a grand success, a grand success in the form of the voting rights for the African Americans in 1965. Now, I'm not an expert on that. You know, I've just done a little bit of research in that particular area, obviously with inspiration from Dr. Carson. And I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Carson and let us hear from him, how did Gandhi come to the United States? Now, he, this is a, you know, there's a, I must explain the title of the theme. Don't mistake it as saying that Gandhi went to the US. No, Gandhi never went to the US. But Gandhi's ideas, Gandhi's conceptual framework went to the United States, inspired the African Americans, and which led to the culmination of racism in the United States. Gandhi was about to go immediately after the conclusion of the first roundtable conference in 1931 from England to the United States. But finally, after having thought about it very seriously, Gandhi decided not to go. And you know, Gandhi gave two reasons, which is again very interesting. Gandhi said, you know, Americans may not appreciate austerity in life, because they have plenty. But I live in, I live a very austere life. So I may not be attractive to them. Secondly, the, look at my dress. I am scantily dressed like uh, in, in the eyes of the Americans. So Americans may not like me. That here is, a, you know, here is somebody who is scantily dressed and who leads an austere life. They don't go well with American culture ethos. So uh, Gandhi said nonviolence may work. Nonviolence may be effective, but if they come to know that this nonviolence is being propagated by me, probably they would get alienated. So Gandhi persuaded his friends not to insist on that. So Gandhi never went to the United States. So when Dr. Carson will talk about how did Gandhi come to the US, he was simply talking about the ideas. The idea of nonviolence, the idea of love, the idea of care, the idea of concern, which were sources of inspiration as far as African Americans were concerned. So, Dr. Carson will dwell on in detail 
on how Gandhi, not the historical Gandhi, but how Gandhi, the civilizational Gandhi, became an important source of inspiration for the African Americans to fight against racism. I think this is enough introduction to understand Dr. Carson, to understand the theme, and to understand why I got drawn into this particular very unusual theme. I mean, Indian historians normally do not get drawn to this kind of theme. But somehow or the other, since I have got curiosity in, in you know, un, unfathoming a lot of unknown stuff, I got drawn to this particular theme. And I'm very happy this book was well appreciated um, by the, uh, the African-American historians and also those who are fighting against racism. Now, friends, I request the organizer to start Dr. Carson's lecture. Very happy to talk about the issue and the background of African American connection to the Gandhian legacy. It's a very interesting subject and it kind of co coincides with the development and the expansion of the black political vision uh, in the 20th century. And so I think it would be best to start with W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, du Bois was the leading scholar of his era. And um, from the turn of the century uh, through the 1950s, he was a major presence in American history. He was a founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, but I think in terms of his connection to the Gandhian legacy, it's important to mention that Du Bois, when he wrote his book, Souls of Black Folk in 1903, he talked about the problem of the 20th century being the problem of the color line, uh, the division of the world into the white um, dominated uh, nations and the colored nations of the world. And so one of the first to begin to conceive of this global struggle against uh, Western imperialism throughout the world. Uh, he was a founder of the Pan-African movement, um, developing uh, a movement that had a number of Pan-African congresses uh, during the, uh, from the early 1900s um, through um, uh, actually well into the 1970s when there was another Pan-African um, conference. But um, his vision also included Asian nations, uh, which he saw as being potential um, collaborators in this struggle against European imperialism. And we can see this um, by the 1920s uh, when Gandhi arrives um, back in India, that uh, his arrival there and the launching of a nonviolent struggle in India has a tremendous impact on African Americans. Uh, newspapers, uh, black newspapers covered uh, the story of, of Gandhian struggle. Um, and Du Bois at one point uh, as the editor of the Crisis magazine, which was widely read in the black community, he writes a letter to Gandhi in the late 1920s. Um, uh, and, and this letter actually comes after Gandhi meets um, um, Madame uh, Naidu who uh, had arrived from India and uh, she um, was greeted in New York uh, during the 1920s, uh, Du Bois meets with her. He writes to Gandhi, Gandhi replies. And, uh, and his response is published in the crisis. Uh, so we can see that, that this um, 
interests. And it's neutral on both sides. Gandhi is very interested in what's going on um, in among Black Americans, and Black Americans are very interested in what's going on in India. And this leads to uh, the uh, trip of an American, uh, Black American delegation uh, to Asia, not just India, Ceylon, other countries, but um, the, probably the highlight of this, of this um, um, delegation was the meeting with Gandhi in 1936, in March of 1936. Uh, so this is the first time we begin to see uh, Black leaders, and this delegation includes um, people like Howard Thurman, uh, Sue Bailey Thurman, his wife, who's also very active uh, her, in her own right. And it includes Benjamin Mays, who will go on to become um, president of Morehouse College at the time when and Martin Luther King is going to Morehouse. And we can look at, at the meeting as a starting point of this direct connection where you have Gandhians um, uh, coming to the United States, African-Americans going to India, and this intensifies this exchange exactly at the time when, when the Indian independence movement is, is developing, um, uh, becoming increasingly in fact effective. And uh, I, I think that when we see how someone like Thurman, uh, who returns to the United States, writes uh, one of the key books, Jesus and the Disinherited, because one of the things that Gandhi asked about is why are African Americans still Christians? You know, that, that Christianity was uh, a religion of oppression, you know, that it, because uh, slaveholders and segregationists had used the Bible as justification for, the, for their treatment of African Americans. And uh, that question leads Thurman uh, to develop uh, the ideas that he puts in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, which is published in the late 1940s. And he reinterprets Christianity as the religion of the oppressed, um, drawing not so much from the um, gospels written by Paul, uh, which uh, as Paul is a Roman citizen, uh, could be interpreted as um, accepting the world as it is um, toward the idea that religion was, um, that the Christian religion was supposed to be a message of hope to the oppressed of the world. And um, among the people who were very impressed by Thurman's book was Martin Luther King. Uh, so we can see Thurman's impact and Benjamin Mays's impact as as being important in in um, the development of Martin Luther King's ideas. Um, for Martin Luther King, Mays um, was the uh, most important influence on his life. You know, that's the way he describes it. And while at at um, Morehouse, um, Martin Luther King works with George Kelsey who again provides him with the theological basis uh, for seeing Christianity as a religion of the oppressed. Beyond these, uh, we can also see that um, other black leaders began to come to India uh, among those in the 1940s who are very significant. Uh, James Farmer, uh, who goes on to form the Congress of Racial Equality, one of the major civil rights organizations of the 1960s. And uh, another person would, would be Beard Rustin, um, who comes to India uh, during the late 1940s and spends a great deal of time there, uh, comes back. Uh, Rustin is a person who is um, probably one of the most uh, influential activists of the 40s and 50s. He works closely with A. Philip Randolph, the, the Black labor leader, who uh, is the first to put forward the notion that Black people should march on Washington. This is in 1941. Um, and 
and he um, hires Rustin as the youth organizer for uh, this March on Washington. And, and these two individuals form a close bond uh, that is evident in the 1960s when A. Philip Randolph proposes the March on Washington for 1963, and he insists that Baird Rustin be, a, be the organizer of that march. So uh, again, we can see that people who have had uh, um, these Indian influences, Gandhian influences, um, uh, play major roles. Um, Rustin, uh, for example, is one of the founders of King's organization, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference formed in 1957, uh, uh, right after the Montgomery bus boycott. And um, Rustin for um, part of the late 1950s, and then again, um, perhaps even into the 1960s, he writes uh, ideas for Martin Luther King, um, uh, helps him write his first book. Um, Rustin is, is you know, a, a key influence on, on Martin Luther King because uh, Rustin has has the ability to translate these Gandhian ideas into, into actual strategies of, of action in the black community. Uh, so um, I, I could also um, mention um, James Lawson as perhaps the central uh, figure in terms of tra transferring Gandhian ideas to the United States. Uh, James Lawson, as a, as a much younger than, than these other figures I've mentioned. Um, he comes of age in, in the 1940s, early 1950s. And uh, he's a person who wants to be a minister, who becomes a minister. Um, but uh, he's also a um, person who is opposed to military service. So during the 1950s, He's actually uh, imprisoned, and, and but then is able to come to India as a missionary initially. But while he's in India, he studies Gandhian ideas very extensively. This is all during the early 1950s. And um, after his return, he meets with King, and King suggests that uh, he move to the South and help the the, the struggle that's going on. This is right after the Montgomery bus boycott and the success of that move. But um, I should mention that King at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott does not really describe it in Gandhian terms. I think that that's the thing that develops um, gradually uh, when um, Rustin, Baird Rustin comes to Montgomery to advise King at the start of the bus boycott, I was surprised to find that King has an armed bodyguard in the house. And so he has a discussion with him about uh, that maybe this is not appropriate. And, and, and in that discussion, um, Coretta is the guns there. And this is despite the fact that um, their house is bombed when uh, Coretta and their young uh, daughter um, are inside the house. And, um, and this is uh, in the early months of the, of the bus boycott. But I think what we see is that Mark becomes more and more very, um, the rightness of the Gandhian approach. And uh, by 1957, he's uh, sometimes described in the press as the American Gandhi. And, uh, and, and Rustin and um, James Lawson are among those who, who uh, uh, provide him with the, the knowledge necessary uh, to translate Gandhian ideas into, um, into a movement in, a, in the United States. Um, I should mention going back to uh, that initial meeting in uh, India of the of the black delegation there in 1936 is that they came 
not um, simply absorbing ideas. They came with critical questions for Gandhi about how, um, how might his ideas be applicable to the United States. And they, they ask him you know, strong questions about you know, how, how can we train our people? This, this doesn't seem to come uh, naturally, this idea that nonviolence can overcome uh, the violence of the oppressor. And, um, and some of Gandhi's ideas, you know, I, I remember from that conversation, the transcript of it, that Sue Bailey Thurman just asked you know, Gandhi directly, what would you do if your, your brother or member of your family were, was lynched? And Gandhi's answer was, well, you know, sometimes even though your approach might seem suicidal, that you have to um, not give in to hate. Um, you you have to use nonviolence, and then they said, "Well, how can you train people to do that?" And he said, "Well, it takes it takes a great deal of time to do that, and you have to have a, a deep spiritual commitment." Um, so, when we look at, at King, we see that that movement is is um, <coughs> toward Gandhian ideas is is gradual, that he. Um, doesn't immediately um, see himself as the American Gandhi. Perhaps uh, more um, important in terms of, of Gandhian ideas is with James Lawson, because when he comes back, he actually goes to Nashville, Tennessee. And in the late 1950s, he begins um, teaching a relatively small group of maybe two dozen uh, students um, and he has a workshop uh, on Gandhian principles. And so during the late 1950s, he is training this small group uh, that includes John Lewis, who recently passed away and, and spent his career as a, as a leading activist. Um, also in that group, Diane Nash, who becomes a leading force during the freedom rights, uh, organizing the freedom ride campaign of 1961, where um, freedom riders, including John Lewis, took the the, uh, the protest movement into the deep south in the states like Alabama and Mississippi, where resistance would be very violent, led by led by the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, so. Um, John Lewis, um, Bernard Lafayette, who's still um, very much active in the movement. Um, um, James Lawson is still very active today. And, um, and um, James Bevel, um, uh, a number of these individuals who would have long careers as leading uh, figures in the Southern struggle. And, and I think that they become the heart of a new organization that um, King's uh, S SCLC helps um, get started, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, so they decide to move forward under their own leadership. And James Lawson writes the statement of purpose of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and becomes one of its key advisors. Um, and, and I think the importance of this is that they are even more determined than Martin Luther King. You know, when the Freedom Riders um, come and you know, the idea behind the Freedom Rides is that you get on a bus and you would ride it through the South. Uh, and when you reached uh, bus terminals, uh, you would try to use the facilities there. And uh, in some cases, this might lead to violent attacks. In other cases, getting arrested. And uh, when the Freedom Riders came in 1961, this is in May of 1961, they come to Atlanta. And Martin Luther King just says, this is, this is just too dangerous. You know, when, once you get into Alabama and Mississippi, you will have people who want to kill you. And uh, so he decided not to go. Um, and when the Freedom Ride bus reached Al Alabama, 
they were greeted with um, deadly violence. Um, they, their bus was firebombed and, and they were fortunate to get off without all of them being um, burned alive when the bus caught fire. Um, this was in Anniston, Alabama in, in May. And uh, the original group, the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, decided to call off the Freedom Ride. But John Lewis and Anne Nash decided that despite the violence, they were going to continue this ride and they were going to recruit other students. So we can see that what developed in Nashville was the equivalent of Gandhi's nonviolent army, you know, that, that this was a, a group willing to use nonviolent techniques despite the violence that they encountered, even at the risk of their own lives. Um, many of them wrote wills before they um, went to, to Birmingham to carry on the Freedom Ride. And um, when they tried to do that in, in Birmingham, they were again beaten by a mob. And they refused to turn back uh, continued the ride into Montgomery, and again, greeted with mob violence. Um, but the impact of this was to put more and more pressure on the federal government under President John F. Kennedy uh, to enforce federal law, which made uh, segregation at interstate commerce facilities illegal. Uh, so, so what the Freedom Riders were doing was forcing the federal government to enforce uh, the regulations that were supposedly on the books. The Freedom Riders, um, um, despite the, all of this violence, decided to continue the ride into Mississippi, which was seen as perhaps the most segregated state in the nation. Once they reached Mississippi through an arrangement with the federal government that to avoid uh, more violence that would be uh, on the front pages of newspapers, made, out, made an arrangement with the Mississippi government so that the Freedom Riders would be nonviolently arrested. Uh, they were. Uh, John Lewis and other Freedom Riders would spend the rest of that summer um, uh, 1961 in a Mississippi prison. And uh, this, it's important to kind of keep in mind that this was a, um, a group of nonviolent activists, all of them very young, but all of them willing to risk their lives and, uh, and certainly their, their freedom by going to spend the rest of that summer in, uh, in prison in Mississippi. Uh, I, I think that what I would see in this is that even though the sit-ins of 1961 and the Freedom Rides eventually involved hundreds, even thousands of, of people, this, the spearhead were these few individuals, you know, not more than a few dozen, who were deeply committed to Gandhian ideas and have learned many of those ideas through James Law and his experiences in, in India. And that, um, so it was not that surprising to me um, in recent months with the passing of John Lewis um, and another of the Freedom Riders, C.T. Vivian, uh, who was part of the Nashville group. You know, these, these were people who recently died. Uh, John Lewis was in his 80s. C.T. Vivian in his 90s, but both of them were people who had responded to this call to continue the Freedom Rides in 1961, and who in the years after that continued to play crucial roles in the African-American freedom struggle. Uh, so, so even as we see that the direct connections um, between the Andean movement and uh, the African-American struggle uh, was limited to perhaps a, a few people. 
I think the impact on the movement was um, tremendous and and it continued for a, a long time. Um, you know, John Lewis probably ended up with, uh, well, I'm sure he ended up with more than 40 arrests during his long career uh, that extended long past the 1960s as he was also involved in the in the uh, anti-apartheid campaign of the 1980s. Um, uh, someone like Bernard Lafayette, a number, uh, another person who was part of that workshop, um, took, uh, he stayed with Martin Luther King uh, to his death in 1968 and took King's message that the next stage of the African-American struggle was to bring these ideas uh, to the world and that there would be uh, a global movement, nonviolent movement. So I can, I can think that uh, in some ways, uh, the Gandhian ideas have come full circle because uh, when we think about Gandhi and the impact of his African, South African experience in terms of developing his, his ideas, during the early 20th century and seeing those ideas being adopted and adapted in Americans in their freedom struggles of the 1950s and 1960s. And then by the time of the 1980s, we see those same ideas um, being part of the South African struggle, but also part of the global anti-apartheid movement, um, perhaps the greatest international um, nonviolent movement of the 20th century uh, that ultimately culminated at the end of the century uh, with the uh, end of the apartheid system in South Africa. Uh, so I think that when the full story of, of these ideas um, is, is told, we can see that, that these Ideas may have started in India, um, but I think some would also say they started in South Africa and they ended up at the end of the century uh, freeing South Africa from um, apartheid. Um, I think with, in terms of understanding uh, the African-American struggle, we can see that, that at, at its crucial infancy, during the early 1960s in terms of the sit-ins and the freedom rights. Uh, Gandhian ideas played an outsized role uh, in terms of, of its impact on that movement. So where do we go from here? I think that's the, the last question and uh, that King asked. Um, how do we globalize uh, the lessons of the struggles of the 19 um, 19th, 20th century and make them ap applicable 21st century. I think that's where we are now. And I think that's why it is so important, uh, the work that we are currently involved in, in terms of building a network. Um, we've called it the Gandhi King Global Network. Um, it's not limited to uh, people influenced by Gandhi and King. I think the idea though, is to build a movement that brings a new force into the world uh, with respect to human rights. I think what we found from the struggles of the previous centuries is that the ideal of human rights has been around uh, certainly since the enlightenment, um, and you know, it's evident in the desire of people to free themselves from slavery and imperialism. But the ability of people to promote and protect human rights has always been um, hampered by reliance on nations uh, as the protectors of, of human rights. So that human rights basically become civil rights for people who have who happen to live in powerful nations. Your passport means something around the world. 
and that becomes your human right. But I think that one thing that we can begin to do is to, by globalizing the movement, uh, is to begin to re-emphasize the idea that human rights can also be protected by a strong global movement um, that can intervene against governments that are abusing human rights of their own citizens and perhaps the citizens of, of other nations. So I, I believe that that's, that's the goal and uh, um, it, it's the challenge that we face in the 21st century. I, I think that we uh, have evidence in the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and its global impact uh, that young people are eager uh, to achieve change. And they're searching for ideas that still have relevance in, in the 21st century. And I think the ideas of Gandhi and King still do have, have relevance of being able to pr provide a nonviolent alternative. Um, King's last book um, talks about the, the world house, how uh, humanity has inherited a world house. All of us have to learn to live in that world house. And so one of the, um, I guess the central mission of the World House Educational Project that uh, launched in recent years is to provide a kind of education that will allow humanity to live peacefully and productively and in justice uh, with each other throughout the world. Um, I think that that's, uh, ultimately the ideal that both Gandhi and King sought uh, when King wrote his book, uh, where do we go from here? Um, he was looking for an answer. And I think in the 21st century, we have to answer his question. Where do we take the movement from this point? And uh, we can learn a lot from this interaction of uh, black Americans, Indians um, who were followers of Gandhi learn a lot from their interactions and how they learn from one another and, and created the ideas that are still relevant today. Hello. 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 So, yeah. Thank you, sir, uh, for your nice, concise, and to the point uh, presentation. And we are very eager. We are very eager to listen in, uh, listening you in future course of action. Meanwhile. Uh, till the time I don't get any question in the chat box. Meanwhile, let me request our today's session chair, Professor Vidhu Chakruti, our vice chancellor sir, to put his remarks on the presentation placed by Professor Claiborne Carson sir. Sir, please uh, pass your remarks. Uh, thank you, Nimai. After Dr. Carson's address, I don't think I have anything new to say because most of the ideas which he put forward for our consumption are the ones which I dealt with in my book. But I think, you know, uh, uh, two important points which probably Carson didn't talk about earlier uh, need special attention. The first one happens to be that the interaction between the African-Americans, I mean, he also used the term black Americans, but I prefer to use it African-Americans. Interaction between African-Americans and the Gandhi and Gandhi or Gandhian ideals is confined to a very microscopic minority. I mean, he referred to the names, some of the names, they are giants, they are giant intellectually. You know, he talked about initially W.E.B. Du Bois, the, then he talked about Benjamin Mays, then he talked about James Lawson, then he talked about a Philip Randolph, 
Then he talked about Beaver Rustin. I mean, these are the big names in the African American struggle for equality in the United States or struggle against apartheid or racism. Now, this is one that the despite being confined to a few of the African Americans, the impact of Gandhian ideas is enormous. That's something which is very interesting and it's a very interesting research question which we can pursue even in the, you know, almost uh, by the, uh, the uh, end of in 2020s. So, you know, the, the point he made uh, very forcefully is that the historical Gandhi may not be important in today's life because, you know, as I said, Gandhi was born in 1869 and was killed in 1948. That is historical Gandhi. But his ideas, which I you know, always emphasize, are transcendental. That's why even in 2020, we are talking about Gandhi and Dr. Carson reiterated the point which I made at the outset, that Gandhi, despite being dead physically in 1948, continues to be relevant simply because he gave us those ideas which are always illuminating as far as humanity is concerned. That's one point which is very new and a very a thought-provoking idea which Dr. Carson put forward. And the second idea, which is also um, comes from Dr. Carson's lecture, is that education is very important. And education is probably uh, an instrument, a powerful instrument indeed, to, to I think, I, what is it, to um, uh, transmit the idea that humanity is one. The differences between human beings the hierarchy among human beings, they're all quote unquote inhuman. So I think education is one which is a kind of you know, label which creates a level playing field for all. Now here I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. He also talks about education being uh, an instrument of deleting, instrument of kind of, you know, um, purging humanity of inequality of hierarchy. And the same point, I think, was reiterated by B.R. Ambedkar. And uh, as you know, he constantly talked about education. And his famous slogan happens to be educate, agitate, educate, organize, and agitate. So education is at the, you know, the foundation of a new kind of humanity. So I think Dr. Carson, you know, by, by putting forward the importance of education in uh, just leveling human society, is a very interesting point, which also Gurudev Tagore talked about. Not only did he talk about, he also translated them into practice in Vishwabharati. So that way, I think uh, Rabindran Tagore's idea are universal in character, which uh, Dr. Carson also endorsed. Now, Carson lecture may have created many questions, but as far as I am concerned, I am very happy that after a long time, I had then uh, a kind of, you know, an opportunity to listen to Dr. Carson personally. And at this age, he, 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 he is uh, 70 plus. At this age, you know, look at his enthusiasm, look at his commitment, look at uh, his, you know, kind of, you know, the, the articulation of the struggle that African-American launched against racism. And I, I'm just, you know, reminded of a very interesting anecdote which he shared with me when he visited me in Virginia. He said that he attended the, the, the Martin Luther King uh, Jr.'s march to Washington in 1963, when he was just 19 years old. He was born in 1944. So you can calculate how old is he. And he said, you know, I, I didn't know anything about it. He comes from Alabama, and that's also a state which he suffered directly because of racism. He said, I didn't know anything about it. I simply heard that Martin Luther King Jr. is uh, going on foot to Washington, D.C. and will have a uh, uh, kind of uh, a congregation of the people who are opposed to racism just uh, next to Lincoln Memorial. So I think, you know, he said, I just got drawn into it 
and I landed in Washington, D.C. And there I couldn't, you know, get very close to where Martin Luther King Jr. spoke, but I could hear the voice that, you know, I have a dream for the, for the Americans. I mean, that particular idea, uh, Dr. Carson said, inspired him so much that, you know, he took a kind of vow to fight for uh, uh, African-Americans against racism. So, you know, uh, I think probably Dr. Carson is one of these, those who took up academic, you know, as a profession, not merely to earn money, not merely to publish books, but to translate his ideas into practice. And, you know, if you, do, you know, uh, interact with the, his students, he's very passionate about what he uh, believed. And, you know, Coretta King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s widow, was so impressed by his commitment that she left all the right of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, writings to Dr. Carson. And Dr. Carson is editing all the volumes. And so far, as I said, seven volumes have already been out. And he said about there are about three volumes to go. So I'm hoping to get all the volumes in print so that you know, we, whatever we don't know about Martin Luther King and his ideas and his text, probably we'll be able to know once the, those books are uh, printed, uh, those books are in the public domain. Now, with these kind of you know, preliminary remarks, again, I express my heartfelt uh, gratitude to Dr. Carson uh, on behalf of Bishra Bharati, on behalf of those who, fought, who always fight against injustice, who always fight against artificial hierarchy, who always fight for justice and build, for building a just society. The, the ideas which we get from, you know, Vishwa Bharati's founder, Gurudev Ravindra Tagore. So I think, you know, I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Carson in person in our university lecture series. And I'm sure in future, if I request him again, he will come back. And if possible, I'd like to invite him to come to Vishwa Bharati once this pandemic is over. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I, mean, I cannot answer the question uh, on behalf of Dr. Carson, but I'll try you know, to give you some idea in, in view of the fact that I also did some work on this particular aspect of African-American history. So questions are welcome. Thank you, sir, for your uh, invaluable remarks. Uh, uh, sir, actually, we have two, three questions for you. First one is, did the American press at that point dominated by the concept of white man's burden and dictated by British have any role in integrating Gandhian philosophy within contemporary American society? Sir, please. First of all, uh, if you look at the history of you know, civil rights campaign in the United States, it started in its full form with the outbreak of Vietnam War, because the Vietnam War is a very, you know, kind of interesting or is a very, you know, uh, benchmark event in the U.S. history, because most of the soldiers who went to Vietnam to fight for the American states were African Americans. So African Americans, the body of African Americans, when it uh, went back to the United States, it immediately created a furor that white Americans escaped being hit by the Viet Cong, while the uh, African Americans, they were just sent as a kind of fodder before the Viet Cong. So I think this created some kind of, you know, uh, enmity, some kind of you know uncertainty uh, among the African Americans, who, so which are to be created a kind of foundation for the battle against racism. Now, if you look at the American press, the Southern American press, where uh, racism was most dominant, did not refer to this fact at all. I mean, but if you look at the press from the United States, uh, from, from New York especially, the, the East Coast, you'll find that there are many newspapers which really supported openly the battle for African Americans and especially the ploy of the white Americans to send the African American soldiers to the Vietnam War only and keeping the white American uh, soldiers away from the Vietnam War. So I think the the you know it's very difficult to precisely respond to the question 
but one can make a very general point saying that in general american press because it was dominated by the white americans did not give adequate space to the battle uh, waged by the african americans against any kind of injustice hierarchy or racism and second point which you said is white 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 uh, means burden now it is true and i think i, I would recommend uh, the the person who asked this question to read a book by gunnar mirdal and that the title of the book is the american dilemma and the gunnar mirdal who wrote the asian drama you know that and he is the one who got nobel prize in economics he is from sweden and he wrote a very interesting book they call american dilemma and if you look at this book american the american dilemma you will find the point which the uh, the question the person was be the question made that particular white men's burden that particular point came up again and again so obviously the white men you know suppressed uh, brutally suppressed the um, the slaves and uh, and even the top americans like you know jefferson in william jefferson who who wrote that uh, men men uh, are everywhere men are born free now that gentleman maintained slaves so i think you know if you look at the american history at that point of time you will find the slave owning doesn't seem to be a sea on the contrary it's very much part and parcel of american way of life so it's certainly white men's burden and uh, as i said when um, martin luther king jr king jr undertook this campaign it was not merely confined to the african americans there are many white americans who took part in this particular campaign and those who are interested you know i would like to recommend two films um, which will give you an idea of how white americans also got drawn to the campaign launched by the african americans one is certainly a film by um, uh, in which uh, sydney poiter acted is called mississippi burning uh, mississippi burning and the other uh, film which is little you know little old is called the and i am forgetting the exact title it's uh, uncle tom's cabin uncle tom's cabin is an old film based on the book of uncle uh, tom's cabin i mean these are the two films if you see them then you will realize that even against the torture meted out to the african americans by the white americans there are there is a voice uh, raised by the white americans so i think you know historically speaking you may say that there are not many white americans who um, raised voice against this kind of Uh, torture but there are few white americans who really felt that african americans were brutally tortured by their white american counterparts and they felt it uh, kind of a duty a duty as a human being to challenge them to combat them to oppose them i mean this is uh, probably my response to your question if i wish uh, dr carson was here to respond to your question thank you sir one more question for you and probably this will be the last question and the question is how do you for american citizens to take up and make it you know if you listen to dr carson's lecture very carefully carson made this point again and again that the connection between india and the united states or african americans and the gandhians is confined to a few african americans but the impact on them is enormous now this sentence to me is very critical to understand or to respond to the question being asked that if you look at the press in particular especially in the east coast then the press appears to be favorably disposed to the struggle launched by the african americans if you look at the press in the west coast the response does not seem to be so favorable 
But if you look, look at the press in Southern America, especially in Mississippi, uh, Virginia, Alabama, then you'll find the press was highly conservative and did not give any space to the nonviolent movement launched by Gandhi in South Africa or in India, and the nonviolent movement launched by Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States. So it's very difficult to generalize the idea which you may find in India, because in you know, Americans, the, uh, the approach of the Americans in general to the idea of African American discrimination against African Americans does not seem to be uniform. As I said, East Coast is apparently favorable. West Coast doesn't seem to be so clear in making a judgment. It was a kind of, you know, very dicey response which you get from the West Coast. But if you look at the press or the, if you talk to the human beings who belong to South America, which is actually the citadel of racism in the United States, which is the, you know, the kind of the, the epicenter of the battle in, in the 1860s against the abolition of slavery, which led to the 1893 proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, which was signed by Abraham Lincoln. So if you look at the press of South America, I mean, I'm talking about the southern part of the United States, then you'll find they are highly, highly conservative, and Gandhi was nowhere to be seen. So I think, you know, I find three completely different or diametrically opposite points of view in the United States vis-a-vis -vis Gandhian ideas, vis-a-vis -vis the, the strategy which African Americans had adopted in the United States to combat racism, to combat racial segregation or racial segmentation in, the, in society. So I think, you know, I, there is no very, you know, very easy answer to this question. The answer is very complex, given the fact that the response is also very fluid and very uh, different from one place to another. That's my response. Thank you, sir. Well, sir actually, if your time comes, meanwhile, we have two more questions. Can we take it up? Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, the first question is, kindly explain how materialism of American culture takes Gandhi's idea of voluntary poetry. You know, again, you know, the, this is the point which I made at the outset, that when How Howard Thurman, you know, Dr. Carson talked about Howard Thurman and Bayward Rustin, you know, when they came and met Gandhi in London during the uh, round table conference number one, Gandhi was almost agreeable to go to the United States and at the last moment he decided not to go. Now this is, uh, this has a link with the question which you have asked that Gandhi's austerity, Gandhi's plain living, Gandhi being scantily dressed did not appear to be of any influence to the Americans because the Americans, you know, survived in plenty. Those African Americans who came and met Gandhi, they are all well off African Americans. For them, you know, suit tie is not a luxury. For them, scantily dressed means poverty. But you know, Gandhi took up, took this scantily dressed posture after he left the United States, sorry, after he left South Africa in 1914, deliberately, because he felt that the majority of the Indians do not have proper clothing. So for Gandhi, being scantily dressed is a political strategy to be with the Indians in general. Now, this will not work in the United States. So Gandhi's austere life, Gandhi's plain living will never ever be appealing 
to the Americans. As a result, at the last moment, you know, Howard Thurman writes in his autobiography that at the last moment, when Gandhi, over everything was almost arranged. Gandhi will take the ship from Liverpool for New York, and then finally he withdrew, uh, saying that he, it's difficult for him to go because the sort of popularity which you have got of Gandhism, Gandhian ideas of non-violence, will be lost immediately simply because Gandhi, the historical figure, will not be acceptable to the African American at large. So this is, you know, the point which I'm making that Gandhi's lifestyle, Gandhi being Gandhi, will not be appealing to the Americans at all, to the African Americans at all, simply because the he's being Gandhi will not augur well with the African Americans in general. That is how I, I see uh, Gandhi. Um, Gandhi's response, Gandhi's decline to go to the United States at that point of time. Thank you, sir. Uh, then, uh, last and final question: Was there any African American who opposed the movement started by Dr. King? You know, I, I I I told you just now that if you want to know more about this, I think please. Today, you'll get this film. It's an old film called, entitled Mississippi Burning. Now, Mississippi Burning is a film. Mississippi, as you know, is a, is a, is a state in uh, southern part of the United States. And this is the uh, state which is notoriously famous for racism, for racist attack on the African-Americans. And the story is that, you know, a lot of uh, uh, some uh, white Americans came to Mississippi uh, who are the human rights activists, and then they their body disappeared. They were killed, and their body disappeared. And Sidney Poitier, the actor, came to investigate. And then he found out the, the brutal activities of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, a rightist organization in the United States, very racist, and they used to kill the African Americans, just like, you know, a play. So uh, these uh, white Americans who came uh, as a human right activist to Mississippi were killed and their body disappeared. So then, you know, a group of white Americans, a group of detectives came to Mississippi and Sidney Poitier happens to be the leader of that group. And how did they found out, how did they find out the, the story behind this? That, you know, uh, why did the Ku Klux Klan kill these uh, human human activists, well, though they were whites, yet they were human rights activists, and they were in support of the African Americans. So they became the enemy of Ku Klux Klan, that uh, white racist group. And as a result, they were killed. So I think you know the opposition opposition was inherent because most of the white Americans, uh, at, uh, at least in the 60s and 70s, thought that you know the white uh, african americans should not have the right of voting simply because they were inferior uh, by birth to the white americans so they should not be given the right which the white americans enjoy at that point of time so and as you know jf kennedy who was killed um, at that point of time in 1664 just before the adoption of civil uh, the uh, voting rights act of 1965 one of the reasons uh, why he was killed was that he was soft towards African Americans. And as a result, I mean, he was killed for a variety of reasons, but that was one of the charges which Oswald, who killed uh, John F. Kennedy, Oswald mentioned when the you know, jury asked him the questions. So I think uh, the, the opposition or the an uh, animosity of the white Americans vis-a-vis -vis the African Americans was inherent. And if you look at the pages of history of that particular period of time, then you, you'll find that you know these, there are many examples um, showing that uh, African Americans were tortured like anything by the white Americans. And in most cases, white Americans remain calm and remain non-responsive. And you know, I, I'm telling you my personal experience 
um, uh, of um, teaching in Virginia. And, you know, I, uh, I used to show um, uh, many Indian films to um, uh, convey my point that in India, we also oppose the British imperialism. And uh, one of the films which was very popular among my students was Lagan. And then in you know, Lagan, there is a character, white man, white character, you know, who was the in charge of that particular, you know, um, uh, what is called um, congregation of the army uh, soldiers. And that person was also the captain of the cricket team. And then he lost. And then one of the um, uh, African American students came to me and said, "Sir, I don't like that stop hole." because there are many stock holes, they exist in the United States. So then I asked him, what does this mean? Then he, she explained me in private, but the point I'm trying to make that when they saw Lagan and when they saw the, the, the torturous behavior of that uh, white man who was the captain, and they found a kind of similarity between how the white Americans behave vis-a-vis -vis the African Americans in the United States. This is my personal experience, and I'm talking about 2011, 12, and 13. So, you know, the point I'm trying to make here, the, the sort of animosity, the sort of difference, the sort of hierarchy, which exists even today, you know, in the United States, and you'll find plenty of literature on this, it, it, it shows that somehow or the other, white Americans, you know, may not have forgotten the, the fact that the African Americans uh, could be similar to them in terms of, you know, what is called intelligence, in terms of capability, and in terms of what not. So I think they do not uh, appear to agree to the idea that African Americans and white Americans are similar in all respects. So you'll find many literature coming up now that you know, somehow or the other, the, the Trump's America is nothing but an attempt to reinforce the, the supremacy of the white Americans vis-a-vis -vis the African Americans and also the immigrants. So I think you know the point which you made by asking this question and doesn't um, have a very precise answer simply because the historical trend of the difference between African American and the white Americans uh, continues to exist, continues to be you know, endorsed by those who nurture um, some kind of you know, hierarchical society. I mean, the same is true in India, you know, uh, even in India, you know, the, in the name of caste, you know, we uh, sustain segregation. And you know that, you know, in, in uh, North India, there are many cases of uh, killing if um, the guy or the girl marries an uh, outcast. So I think this sort of hierarchy and uh, this sort of, you know, um, brutality or animosity is inherent in human being. So though we talk about equality, though we talk about the principles of enlightenment, but at the heart of heart, sometimes we nurture the values of being hierarchical, um, uh, which are manifested when a Dalit um, uh, woman is killed because she married a non-Dalit person and vice versa. The, so, I mean, the, the hierarchy is something which is uh, a global in character and it is not um, uh, peculiar to the United States or it is not peculiar to India. I think hierarchy in terms of caste in India, hierarchy in terms of race in, 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 in the United States, hierarchy in terms of race in South Africa or hierarchy in terms of wealth elsewhere. So I think hierarchy of any kind gives a kind of you know justification for human beings who to support hierarchy so i think you know i find it not very peculiar to the united states or to india or to the states or to south africa which is governed by you know some kind of racism or india some uh, caste segregation or america racism that's true everywhere so i'd say it's a universal truth that those who have access to wealth they also practice hierarchy. So I think that's why there is a difference between rich and the poor. There and this particular difference between rich and the poor, instead of being bridged down, is getting high, uh, you know what is called greater and greater and greater. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. So uh, we are at the last part of our today's session. Uh, let me now allow to offer word of thanks as a part of customary of any program. So at the very outset, let me extend our heartfelt gratitude to our today's speaker, uh, that is respected Professor Clevon Carson, who have been given an enlightening speech on how Mahatma Gandhi's ideas came to United States as part of Vishwabharati lecture series entitled 20th lecture today. And after 8th February, physical mode till 19th lecture we have. Today it's a kind of online mode, Vishwabharati lecture series lecture. And you know, let us now extend our heartfelt gratitude and thanks to not only our Vice Chancellor, sir, not only as chairman of this session, not only as member of the Vishwabharati Poribar, but also as Gandhian expert today this lecture is different in manifold, out of which one is today we are having and fortunate enough to have two Gandhian experts. One is, of course, Professor Carson Clevon, and another is our VC sir. Without him, I think this question answering session and the topic cannot be justified before the audience. So, sir, on behalf of Vishwabharati, let us extend our heartfelt gratitude to you, sir, not only as chairman of the session, but also speaker of the session too. Thank you, sir, for your illustrious presence and also thought-provoking remarks. Thank you, sir. And also, this is the lecture when we are having, missing our former, this is actually founder chairperson of this lecture series, none other than Professor Asa Mukherjee, madam. Today in the morning, madam asked me, Nimai, what about preparation? Do you found any problem? If any problem, please tell me if I have anything to do, I will do it. So this is the, uh, the actually attitude what she poses. And by, his, by her question, she offered me lots of motivation and encouragement. Uh, so thank you, madam. We need your physical and virtual presence with us to conduct the Vishwabharati lecture series for future. Thank you, madam. And we also solicit future cooperation from you on the same uh, kind. And then let me extend our heartfelt gratitude to all the participants. There are 10 to 12 participants in physical mode in the Vishwabharati Library Conference Hall. And there are more than 60 participants in virtual mode in and out Vishwabharati. And this is for the first time, perhaps, by virtue of technology and by virtue of this pandemic, the, other than Vishwabharati fraternity, having some sort of scope to attend this session. And at the same time, many of other than Vishwabharati fraternity asking for feedback link for certificate, like all other webinar and seminar. So let me just give you one clarification. This lecture series does not require any feedback link and we do not have any provision to giving some sort of certificate. So this is a purely academic culture of Vishwabharati. So this lecture session will be uh, in future course of action. You may attend it to encourage your academic knowledge and also you will have been some sort of scope to listen in and out Indian noted academician by this lecture series. And in this scope, let me just announce and invite you all to attend on 9th September at 4 p.m. in this online platform to listen a great economist and many folks. The title of the lecture is India and Asia to be delivered by Professor Lord Meghnath Desai British House of Lords and an Emeritus Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. This is a glimpse of his introduction. And on 9th, we will give a brief introduction about him. So you all are invited to join the session. And for organizing this session, let me extend our heartfelt gratitude to university administration in general, register, join registers in particular. And my colleagues of Central Library Vishwabharati, they are giving and offering lots of cooperation technically, mentally, and physically to me. That is why we are able to successfully organize this session. And also, some sort of cooperation we are also receiving from Computer Center in charge. So let us extend our heartfelt gratitude to all the incumbents, those who are directly and indirectly help us to stage this 20th lecture under Vishwabharati Lecture Series. And finally, last but not least, I am really grateful to all the Vishwabharati fraternity members, like teachers, officers, non-teaching members, 
research scholars, students. So with these few words, let us conclude our today's session. Thank you very much. Stay safe and secure. Don't maintain socially distant. Please physically distant, maintain physically distant and stay socially connected. Thank you very much. And let me invite you all to attend in our special Monday today at 7 p.m. in honor of uh, let Sri Pranav Mukherjee. So please attend in the Mondi, those who are uh, available in the campus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening to one and all. Thank you.